I'm trying to understand what's the easiest way to communicate the goals of what we're trying to do. Regardless of equipment, whether it's a seeder or whether it's a row crop planter, my goal for that equipment is crop uniformity. Does everybody agree with that? That we're trying to achieve uniformity, okay? But that's kind of an umbrella term and that, that's kind of painting it with the easy button and if you're playing like buzzword bingo, you're probably real close to blackout at this point, right? So I wanna break it down one more step. I wanna to go to uniformity of emergence, then the plant density, and then we'll talk about uniform nutrition and visibility, okay? In my simple mind, I, I can't understand the, the in-depth consequences of everything, right? But what I can't get past is if seed doesn't come out of the ground, does the nutrition matter? I can't get past that in my own mind. I can't attack plant density if I don't have a uniform emergence. If it's by guess and by golly of where that seed is coming out of the ground, in my field, I can't attack a, a game plan very well, right? So I have to have uniformity first. Once all seeds are out of the ground and I have consistency in my operation, regardless of equipment, now I can start to work on plant density. Okay, anybody know who Jimmy Frederick is? Anybody seen what he grew for, uh, for beans in Nebraska this year? Anybody see the record? He grew 137 bushel beans on what population? Did any, anybody see it? 137 bushel soybeans on less than 80,000 population beans. Anybody want to do that? Anybody want half of that with 80,000 beans? That'd be all right, wouldn't it? Okay. So I can attack that plant density and work on lowering my input cost of the genetics that I'm deploying to the field if I have a uniform stand. Okay. Once I have a stand and I know what my density of, of plants or population, if you want to use that word, now I can attract or I can start working on nutrition, right? But if I fertilize for 1.6 million seeds of wheat and 1.1 come out of the ground, I am now in luxury, right? I have more fertilizer on the field than required to grow the yield that I'm looking for. Is there room for luxury right now? There never really was, right? But even now, the luxury consumption side of things needs to be eliminated because that's free money that's laying out there going to waste. And so whether that's a soybean crop, a corn crop, whatever it is, you don't put 35,000 corn plants in a field hoping to get 28 and then plan your fertility around 28, right? Okay, we've got to narrow those windows of what we're trying to get for emergence, then we've got to get our plant density figured out, then I can attack nutrition. But if I have no visibility to any of that, how can I attack any of them? Does that make sense? Okay, so stepping stones of where I want to conquer first, and that's why you hear us talk about downforce and depth management as much as we do. And now that we have moisture information coming in, we can understand what's driving my emergence or what's hurting my emergence, right? Okay, so the reality of it is this, delta force by itself, 2020 by itself, closing the color of the paint, the row unit you run with, whatever that is, must work as a system. Okay, it has to work as a team, it can't just stand up as a Heisman winning quarterback and have no offensive line, he'll, he'll never win the award, right? Because all he does is scramble for his life at that point. And so, you know, let's tip the cap to NDSU, okay, no applause, nothing. You guys have won so many times, there's no applause, right? Okay, so tip of the cap from a Jackrabbit fan, you guys did it again. You know, when the last coach left, they said, ah, they'll, they won't do it anymore, right? This coach left and they, you know, they mailed the marker to Brookings, right? We don't even have to play the game next year, it's just over, the dynasty dies because you changed coaches? Probably not, okay? But it's not built around a coach, it's not built around a player, okay? Um, last I checked, Carson Wentz is in the NFL and you guys are still winning, okay? Easton Stick's going to leave and you're still going to win, okay? And it's not built around one fan. So let's think about the team that you're deploying to your field, okay? Because again, this is all a big system, right? There's no one magic bullet that if I just bought X piece of equipment, all would be solved, okay? So think about your team just a little bit. We built this slide deck a little bit with uh, the guy that's up in London, London, Ontario, given the same one, and he said we can't talk about hockey. So he had to go through and make all, or make all the football helmets into hockey. He just couldn't get past that analogy. But you start looking at some of the players on the field. How many of you feel like the genetic superpower that you have today in the field deployed is better than it was 10 years ago? How many of you think if you're in central and western South Dakota, 
Brown County, South Dakota, and West, that you survived last, the last two years D2 droughts and D3 droughts with 20 years ago's genetics? Probably not, right? I referenced a little while ago, my neighbor's in the back of the room, okay? We get 10 inches of rain and we grow an average corn crop. We have no business whatsoever, but because of the fertility programs, because of the genetics, because of the improvement in the process of how we farm today versus 20 years ago, we, we sustain through tougher weather. You have better modes of action to handle disease, weeds, pest management, all of that, right? You now have, as much as everybody wants to fight over it right now, you have decision agriculture or data ag, whichever way you want to call it. You have more information at your fingertip to understand why things happen. They're becoming less opinion and more fact, right? If you're willing to look. And so you've got a lot of these things here. The coach on the sidelines is the historical observations, your yield data, your, your team that you have, all the different samples there, but we still have to execute, right? I can go make the most in-depth multi-layer yield and satellite and all these other maps and make you the world's best prescription to go plant with. And if that planter pit spits out 70% singulation, and the chains on it are all rusted and it's jumping all over the place, does it execute that prescription? No. Okay, so we have to look at our players that are on the field and understand whether they're driving uh, the right success. And so as we look at the air seeder, I don't think it's a big secret that it's been dropping the ball for the last forever. Okay, there is no new tech on those. There's still just a controlled spill at best. You know, it's brute force, right? It covers a lot of acres really fast. We can get a lot done. That's why we buy a couple of them and just motor through the acres, right? We all know that they're leaving opportunity behind. There's not a lot of finesse in there. And so just a quick review. They've covered this in two other sessions, right? It's moisture, oxygen, and temperature. Maybe a little bit of fertility, depending on who we talk with. That's what's required to hit emergence, okay? If we miss it shallow, okay, we're going to be in little light moisture. We're going to be a little behind. If we're too heavy and we go too deep, we can plow a little bit. We can get into an anaerobic environment. If we get into the cold soils, we get some of that chilling issue that's out there, and there's some challenges. So we've got to balance all of those risks, which you are today. If I go out and I start planting and I lose that plant density, my population doesn't come out of the ground. It's not that where it stops, right? You don't just stop at, hey, I'm short on my seed instead of, the 180,000 I wanted in my beans, I'm at 150, okay? I now have just wasted 30,000 seeds. I paid for genetics that cost 3x what they did 15 years ago, and they died because they couldn't hit moisture, because the piece of equipment dropped them in dry soil, right? Now I have variable growth stages. My canopy doesn't canopy in the entire field, so now I've got water retention issues. I've got areas that the evaporation is going faster than the transpiration is. Okay, I've got different pest management in different parts of the field. I've got weed management problems. I've got lodging in one area and the combine's running half empty so I can't set it right in the other part of the field. And I've got luxury fertilizer situations where I've got extra fertilizer sitting there that I don't need. At what point do we just go back to the problem and stop trying to solve the solution or start solving for the symptoms, start solving the problem, okay? You look at an air seeder. How many people plant soybeans with an air seeder in here? Do you run the same population as your planter? Or is it higher? How much higher? 20%? Can you get by with 10%? Depends who I ask, right? I still know people that plant 220,000 population through a drill. Not too bad a deal at 25 bucks a unit on beans, but hey, they're closer to 70 than 25, right? And that's becoming more and more painful, and we've got to figure out how to control this a little bit better. So we've talked about weed up here last year, but I want to talk about beans just a little bit. Does emergence and stand matter in soybeans? Yes or no? Absolutely it matters, right? What about the timing on it? Does that matter? Sure it does. So Will buys a, a 1990, isn't it? That's what you guys got on the farm? How many years have you run an air seeder? Oh, you went from a 750 to a 1990? Okay. I guess my story doesn't work. All right. Anyway, he planted in 1990. He's an expert. He had a 750 before, so not a lot changed, right? So they go out and they do emergence timing, no different than what we've done in corn, okay? For the last multiple years that we've done planter clinics throughout this area, and as we've talked about in winter conference, we have this flag test. 
You walk out in the field, you wait for day one of the first seed to pop its head through the ground, and you start sticking flags next to all of them that came up that day. You write on the flag, it says day one. Go back out, same time next day, day two, day three, day four, until you got them all up. So Will went down. I'm going to use the word we. I had nothing to do with this. This was you and your team, right? They go out, they put 660-plus flags in their test plot, okay, on a 1990 drill. Ten days it took to get that seed out of the ground. What state were you planting in? Illinois, so it's easier for you. This is on your farm, so it's easy farming, okay. I kid, it's an I state. It's not that easy, okay. Zero to three days, we're going to consider a good emergence. Four to seven days, we're going to consider a late or a moderately late emergence. And eight plus days to emergence, we're going to call severely late. Everybody with me so far? Here's what the stand looks like. The on time took zero to three days. We had 0% pod loss. Okay, Yield potential is 100% there. Moderately late, four to seven days, we lost 38% of the pods. And severely late, we, we lost 50%. What yield potential do we lose in corn if I'm two collars behind? 50% or more, right? So take this to the pod count. We go from 80 pods on the on times to 40 pods in the severely late. I don't think I can raise 60 bushel beans on 40 pods. Okay? You're going to have to produce you know, basically marbles right, to make it happen. Okay? So we know that it's impacting that. So if you think back to the old way, okay, Roundup came out what? 96, 97, 98, somewhere in there is when we started adopting in this part of the world. It used to be easy and it used to be cost effective to just bump the population, put the carpet down, make sure that everything was blanketed out, and if anything po poked its head through that bean stand, round, Roundup was your magic bullet and away we go, right? Everybody's 100% Roundup in here, pretty easy. No dicamba usage in here. Nobody's excited about Enlist. Nobody's running Liberty Beans. It's weed control is easy, right? Was easy. If we fast forward one year from today, will it be harder or easier than it was right now? We've got Palmer in North Dakota, right? So it's going to be harder. We're going to have escapes. Luckily, we now have another mode of action available to us. But we know for a fact, and you guys know this, that this part of the field is going to have significant harder challengers, harder challenges, excuse me, for weed control than the area that has the good stand. What caused it? I don't know, it's not my picture, right? I don't know what caused it, but the reality is it's likely moisture or I ran out of population or whatever it was, right? But something caused this and I'm gonna have to fight through my weed protection for the entire year. Worst case, we go here. Anybody having to do this in your fields yet? Result back to mechanical labor? Okay. It's probably not that far away. There's parts of the country that have to deal with this every single day. They can't stay ahead of it. They've got multiple plants that are, that are resistant and they're really struggling with it. So again, as we go back into the system and we try to fight the outbreak of this, it's not, I need another mode of action. I need the magic bullet herbicide to cover it, right? I need the canopy. I need the water utilization. I need healthy soybeans. I need a good pre-emerge and I need something to help the escape, right? And maybe I just need a team of kids with some hose to go out and handle it whatever's left, but it's going to be a system to go after it. So that's some of the challenge we're looking at trying to solve with the air seeder a little bit is how do I get a better stand of soybeans with my air seeder, okay? Let's move to wheat just a little bit. We start looking at what the optimum heads in a, a yard of stand is going to be, right? If I go too heavy, if I have too many heads per plant, too many in a square yard, what happens? tipped her right over, right? If I go too few, what happens? We go weak, and we got weeds, and we have problems, right? So there's an optimal window that's pretty well known. This particular data comes out of Ontario, okay? We have to hit that number right. And so you sat down, and you made your plan for your spring wheat, and you've tried to determine the optimal population to plant to hit your marks of where you want to be for your particular growing environment. What if the drill doesn't do it right? What if the drill is missing and it's hairpinning and it's shallow and the wings are floating or whatever that may be? Do you have visibility to that? Okay, let's think one other example in here, right? We gotta protect our wheat crop once it's up, right? Wheat is not poverty grass. Wheat 
is highly managed and can work, right? But you don't just broadcast it out there and walk away, go fishing for the summer and come back and harvest it, right? There's some work that's involved in the middle of it. And so as you look at a lot of the, the herbicide and fungicide treatments that are out there, there's a specific time they want you to hit that pass, right? If you hit the pass at the beginning of flowering or at the flag leaf or at late flowering or we're really late because we were at the lake too long, the cost of the pass is the same, right? Everybody agree? Okay, so getting the, the timing right is what's going to be critical. And so let's just use a hypothetical here. Okay, not a lot of winter wheat guys in the room, but a few. Let's just take a hypothetical of the 15th of September. Flowering is going to start somewhere at the end of April, beginning of May, depending on uh, growing degree days. We've got a five-year average up here to make this chart uh, for Fargo here from the NDSU site. If I'm a couple days behind an emergence, let's say five, and we come up towards the end of September, that pushes me to flowering into May. If I'm really behind and I didn't get into that moisture like we've struggled with the last couple years, if I'm going to hold off, I'm going to hold off, I'm going to hold off, I'm waiting on a rain, and the rains don't show up in September, I still have to go at some point, right? So even if it goes even worse and gets into October, that puts me 11 to 14 days behind. So you look at Caramba's data on here, and it tells you right there on the, on the label of when to spray. Okay? You can go out a little bit early, you can go a little bit late, and it'll work, but it's best if you stay between anthers and 30% flowering. That's their data. It says make sure you do that. So which part of the field do we look at to determine this? The one that we like to see, or do we go find the, the worst spot in the field, the best spot in the field, take an average of that somehow? Or if I work on my emergence side, can I try to get more of that plant mass into that growth stage if we're a little more consistent. Look at Prosaro, same data, right? There's a benefit to spraying. You look at the early head stage, we can go out and we can pick up just short of six bushel by putting Prosaro on. If I hit it in the sweet spot, I can go to nine, and if I go to late flowering, I can hit seven. The cost of this application pass is identical across all three timings, right? If I can time it right, I have free yield. Right? I'm not gaining any yield, I'm just protecting a little bit more. Right? There is no gains here. Okay? I'm just holding on to it a little bit better. So the question is, can we go through and can we run the drill better? So let's talk about some of the, the mechanics to this and then I'm going to bring Will up here. Okay? No different than the planner. A number of you that have seen a planner clinic, we've talked about this a little bit. Okay? As we take off and we start moving through the field, we're going to have forces that are pushing up on the row unit. You're going to have forces pushing down on the row unit. Moisture content from day one of planting to the last day of planting is going to change, right? Moisture content from morning to afternoon is going to change. Temperature is going to change, soil types, the speed, because I'm sure you plant the same speed day one when you're trying to set the drill versus last day of I'm sick of being in here and Derek, you haven't slept in three days and it was in the pickup this morning, so you just want to be done, right? You don't pick up speed at all, right? Certainly not while custom planting. Okay. We know that those forces are going to interact, right? And as I go faster, it's like a water ski. It starts to lift me out of the ground, so I need more downforce. So I go back to my drill, and I look at the drill, and I say, all right, in the center of this drill, I have a four-wheel drive tractor out in front. So I've got to make up some difference for that four-wheel drive tractor that's out there. If you look at the left wing there, it doesn't look like there's a whole lot of residue. There's quite a bit more on the right-hand side. So I'm going to go back to the one static location for up to 96 openers. I'm going to grab one handle and an arbitrary gauge that says green, yellow, red. And I'm going to guess and go, all right, that must be it. That's got to be the best way to fix it, right? If I go too heavy, what happens? If I just crank it up, we'll just go the red and make sure we really push it in. What happens? Anybody ever see your wings just pop right out of the ground? Can't keep them in, so you just put a stack of weights out there and crack your frame. That, you know, it's a balance, right? And so if you, if you bought a new one, you got lucky and they moved this gauge in the cab and they gave you up down buttons on the screen and you can make that adjustment, don't even have to get out of the cab, right? So before Will comes up and talks about some of our data, I want to make sure that we understand a few definitions on here. Okay, there's a little bit of confusion that can come in. So realizing that one population at one fertilizer rate, at one downforce, at one depth, likely is not going to hit the mark in every acre of every field, right? Each field is going to be a little bit different. There's different challenges, and so we're going to have to vary that. Okay, so to understand our downforce, let's make sure we understand a few terms. Okay, if you look at the field view map and you see a blue dot, okay, on the 2020 it pops up and it says loss of ground contact. It has dropped from 100% down to some other non-100% number. What that's telling us 
is I have a sensor back there on the depth stop of that, that drill or on the row crop planter, either one. It's telling me I have no readings. I haven't seen any weight yet. I am not mechanically at the depth that you have selected on that drill. Okay, that means that my seed is shallow. Now, I can't tell you, based on the blue dot, is it a sixteenth of an inch or is it on top of the ground? All I know is we're not at desired depth. What's going to happen is if I am only that sixteenth or an eighth inch or a quarter inch shallow, is I haven't firmed a sidewall yet at all. So I've stuck a piece of iron in the, in the ground. I've tried to open up a ditch to get that seed in there, and the sidewalls are sloughing off on me. And I'm getting dry dirt, even worse. I have a depth problem, but I've got dry dirt underneath the seed, and I have an emergence problem. So the result of the blue dot means I have inconsistent emergence. Okay, I'm going to have a weak stand. If I'm lucky, I get a rain right after and it gets to growing anyway. Depending on the crop, that weak stand that's planted shallow ends up having problems standing up later in the windstorm in August. When it tips over, who do we yell at? You call your seed guy and say, hey man, what's up? Your corn crop, that you, or your corn seed that you sold me fell over had nothing to do with the genetics. It had everything to do with the fact that we planted it shallow. Okay? So the second thing is the green dots and the yellow dots and the orange dots on the screen. Okay? What that's telling me is I've recorded a weight on my downforce sensor. My depth control handle now has something pushing against it, so I'm at my desired depth. Okay? My sidewall integrity is properly firmed up, so that sidewall is there. The seed is able to get to the bottom of the, the trench but it's not so hard on the sidewalls that I can't get the closing system to close me back up. Okay? Then we go red on the top end of this, okay? and that's where I'm on my stop and I'm either at depth or I'm starting to plow. I'm too heavy and plowing down into some softer ground. Sidewalls have the potential, if I have the moisture, to start smearing. We have difficulty closing. We've got restricted root development. If it's so bad on the sidewalls that my closing wheel struggles, I could end up with open furrow out of this. Okay, so I just want to make sure that everybody understands the definitions of where we're at. I'm going to invite Will Frank up here. Will is our, uh, our R&D product lead for the, uh, the Air Seeder program. I wanted him to come on up. I'll give you this one. It's working well. Um, I want to bring him up to Fargo and introduce him to the group up here. You've been up here uh, doing some research trips. He's worked with the guys out in South Dakota and a few of them in, uh, in North Dakota over the last couple of years. But uh, welcome to Fargo. Will, tell us a little more of, uh, of what we're seeing. Thanks, Troy. So now that you guys all understand the three states of downforce, if you look at this field, it definitely has two different zones, right? Can you pick out the different downforce levels that were present in both of these zones? So if you have a load sensor to go with this field, it's pretty obvious, right? The left side of this field had a loss of ground contact position or condition. The drill did not have enough downforce to get seed to the proper depth to get it to moisture where those seeds could germinate properly. But if you look at zone two, it's a completely different story, right? This is a lot healthier crop. The seeds did get to moisture here. But do you think if the operator in the cab had this map that they would have done something different at planting time? I think we all would agree yes, right? But he didn't know what downforce state his drill was in because he didn't have the right measurement tool. So we can change that pretty easily by changing the depth adjustment arm and replacing it with this load sensor. So this load sensor measures what's happening on the gauge drill 200 times a second and transmits that uh, to our row controller called an SRM. So we can constantly measure what's happening on the field as you're, as you're planting your crop. So knowing this information makes a better control system very easy uh, to design and implement. And so we have two that we want to talk about today. So the first is cedar force section. So we use a hydraulic manifold and we place that at each rock shaft. So we're breaking up your drill from one downforce section uh, to multiple sections depending on how many rock shafts you have. And this makes sense, right? So Troy touched on it. The, the Rock shafts where the rows right behind the tractor are in a very different environment from those out on the wing and virgin ground. So we want to be able to divide those up and control them independently. So the number of sections that you have will again be determined by the number of rock shafts you have. But if you have a 60 foot drill, we'll convert that into 10 different sections, each being controlled independently. 
So this is a drone image from a soybean uh, downforce plot where we put in uh, different downforce levels with cedar force to try to see how soybeans would respond. And looking across this, you can see the stand does vary. The results showed us that if we had an inadequate downforce level, if we were too light, we had pretty substantial uh, loss in stand. So 39% of our plants did not come up. So if we were in the optimum range, that's really reduced to 7%. But if we're too heavy, we lost 11%. So are you guys okay with wasting 39% of your seed inputs? Soybean seeds, pretty expensive, right? Would you rather spend that 39% and spend that on a better downforce management system that would allow you to decrease your seeding rate and maintain the same stand count that you're getting today? So by measuring these conditions of the row unit, Cedar force section can increase the time that you're within that good downforce window by 20%. So that means for every 500 acres that you seed, another 100 acres are planted correctly. So not only does our stand count go up with an increased uh, time in that good downforce window, but yield goes up as well. So this graph shows that. So as a percent time, good downforce, uh, increase from 78% all the way up to 97, you can see the yield increases from 62 to 68 bushels per acre. So this makes sense, right? Better downforce management, uh, the crop is responding with better roots and, and better yield ultimately. But is your drill set up to capture that yield increase? Without a load sensor, how do you know if you're in this good downforce level? Being able to adjust the down pressure from the cab is something that a few companies have now, but how do you know where to set it if you don't have the right measurement tool? So we put quite a few plots in uh, across the country. Here are results um, from five different locations in North Dakota, South Dakota, and Texas. And so you can see Cedar Force section had an average yield response of 2.6 bushels uh, in applying the proper downforce management to this winter wheat crop. But in some cases, that yield response can be significantly greater. So Travis Messer farms in the southwest corner of North Dakota, and this is his spring wheat field. So in the middle of the field there uh, was Travis's drill. He was running Cedar Force section. And at the bottom of the drill is his dad's drill that had no, it was just a stock drill, no Cedar Force control at all. So this field health image, notice in the middle part of that field just how much more green is in the Cedar Force section of the field. So taking that to yield, Travis compared the zones uh, and the yield in those different zones from Cedar Force to that stock drill. And Cedar Force had a 16 bushel advantage in this wheat and crop. Pretty big, right? So why, why did that happen? So this field was planted wet. And then later as the season went on, uh, the water shut off, right? The drought came and put a lot of stress on this crop. But the plants in the Cedar Forest area where we're able to grow out through the furrow, reach more water, bring in more nutrients, and produce higher yield. But you can see in the yield map, the area in the OEM drill really took a hit. So those, those roots were compacted. They stayed within that furrow. They weren't able to uh, achieve uh, the same level of year because they, they couldn't get to the same level of, of water and nutrients that the Cedar Forest drill could. So this situation just wasn't on one field for Travis. Over his 4,000 acres of spring wheat, Cedar Force had an average increase of eight bushels per acre compared to his stock drill. So when you do the math on Travis's ROI, the, the payoff's pretty big. So he had over a 520% return on his investment just for his spring wheat crop. So we're not talking about paying off kitchen cabinets here, we're talking about trading in for that new four-wheel drive tractor. I mean, this is, these are big dollar amounts here. So pretty amazing results for Travis, so congratulations to him. So that's Cedar Force section. So many of you guys in this room have experienced and reaped the rewards of Delta Force on planters. So Cedar Force row by row brings that same level of performance to your air seeder. So for Cedar Force row by row, we use the same load sensor uh, that we talked about previously, and we install that on every row now. 
We also remove the OEM downforce springs and we install a hydraulic cylinder with an integrated hydraulic valve at every single row. So that load cell is then transmitting uh, that data at seven, every seven sixteenths of an inch at five miles an hour to the SRM and it's comparing the downforce level that it's measuring to what you set in the cab. So by doing that, we're able to control every row independently, right? So row two that's out on the wing again, it's in very different conditions than row 22. But it's constantly asking myself, do I have the right downforce level to optimize my emergence potential? And it can set a different amount of applied downforce than that of row 22. So here's a, a downforce map on the left and an applied downforce map on the right. So just like Delta Force, these results are pretty amazing. This screenshot shows a 99.8% ground contact on the left-hand side of the screen. But the applied downforce map is really like an x-ray of our field, right? There's a lot there that we can analyze and see. We can actually start to see below the surface of the field to see really what's, what's happening in our field. But if you don't have load sensors, you may not see uh, any of these symptoms until your crop starts to emerge. So part of your field's emerging, but others are not. And you say to yourself, like, man, my, my arm hurts, right? What's going on here? But it's not until days later when those same parts of the field haven't emerged yet that you can see just how bruised your arm really is. So you go to WebMD and you type in sore arm. And WebMD says you can have anywhere from a sprain to tendonitis to carpal tunnel, maybe a broken bone, a heart issue, cancer. But how do you know which of these to treat? You need to look below the surface, right? You need a sensor to be able to tell you what symptom to treat because we would treat all of, all of these very differently, right? So do I have a soil issue? Do I need more tile? Do I have some type of herbicide carryover issue? How many medical uh, issues today are mistreated because we don't understand our symptoms? So with load sensors, again, we can see what's hap happening uh, below the surface of the field. So this applied downforce map, you can see the applied downforce needed to range from above 350 pounds to less than 200 pounds. So we can pick out compaction areas like this, right, where the tractor or the, maybe the grain cart ran last year. You can see these blue areas around the outside of the field where the soil finisher ran right before planting and really mellowed out the ground. So this is about 100 pounds uh, less in these areas that we need to apply to, to achieve the proper downforce level than the main body of the field. Here's a low spot in the field that's always wet at planting time. It required a different level of downforce, right? This is another field from Michigan. So here's a, a soil type change. But in this field, the applied downforce map ranged from over 300 pounds to less than 150. An OEM drill can't give you this level of performance. Why is that? OEM drills just don't have the right management tools that you need. They don't have load sensors to tell you what's happening to better diagnose the root cause of the symptoms that you're seeing. So back to this example, if you're a doctor and a patient walks into your office and he can't hold up his arm and he's got a bruise that looks like this, what are you gonna do? You're gonna order an x-ray, right? You wanna see this picture, you wanna see what's happening beneath that surface of the skin. Once you have that picture, now you can be confident in the way you're going to treat it and you can, you can fix that issue, right? So Phil Needham, many of you guys know him. He's like a doctor, right? Phil's an agronomist. He studied wheat all over the world and understands the, the power of a good measurement tool. So he constantly has growers coming to him with, with symptoms in his field and asking him to help diagnose them. So we can use these load sensors to give Phil information and Cedar Force can also use them to automatically adjust as we go through the field to deliver the correct amount of down pressure that's required. So Phil's really excited about the opportunity that this brings to you guys having air seeders. And he's been conducting research with a, a stock drill versus one that has row by row Cedar Force. 
So Phil's data so far has shown a 30% increase in stand count, and this is in winter wheat compared to an OEM drill in standing corn stalks. So this means that 30% more of the seeds that you're putting into the ground actually emerge. So looking at this chart again, so an OEM seeder can get you about 75% a good downforce. Seeder force section can increase that by 20%, where row by row can get you all the way to 99% of the time. So that 99% good downforce level is what enabled Phil's results to show a 30% increase in stand count. So each row is measuring and detecting by itself, right? So he's got 15 foot, uh, 1560 drills, 24 rows. So rather than one seeder or one drill, 24 rows, he's got 24 individual drills. So just like Cedar Force section, we put a lot of, of plots in uh, the last couple years, and this is a, a chart from five different plots from North Dakota, South Dakota, and Michigan. So the average of these plots we measured at 3.9 bushel advantage of Cedar Force Ribo Row. So using the average yields from our, our plots, and you can see some of the assumptions here, 40, 43 foot drill here I'm using. So with uh, Cedar Force section, we're using 18 load sensors, and that system cost is gonna be $27,000. So we can increase our revenue by over $12 an acre, making that break even cost for, for that system be 2,100 acres. So Cedar Force row by row, we've got more load sensors, more SRMs, right? So that, that investment is quite a bit more, but the return on that investment is also, also higher. So revenue increase about $19 per acre. And this is at $4.86 wheat, so that's yesterday's uh, local price, cash price. So the break-even cost for row by row, or the break-even acres for row by row is 3,900 acres. So one thing to note, it doesn't include any seed savings that you guys would have. So for soybeans, we very consistently seen an increase in stand count. So I'm very confident that you guys can decrease your seeding rate and get the same stand count that you're getting today. So according to NDSU, their 2019 crop budget, uh, the average soybean cost for the Fargo area is $60 an acre. So if you know you can decrease your seeding rate by 30%, you can save yourself $18 per acre, right? And that goes right to the bottom line. So pretty awesome results. Um, you know, as a farmer myself, I recognize cash flow is an issue at times, right? And I think the great thing about Cedar Forest and the, the Architecture, how we've designed it, we've really got three systems there. So we talked about two different downforce systems, but really the first is just monitoring only. You can put load cells on, you can see the performance of your drill, and you can go back and, and you can make an adjustment uh, throughout the year. That's gonna be your cheapest option. Kind of the middle of the road option is adding control to that, right, with this rock shaft manifold. And then the third, we can replace your, your OEM springs with this hydraulic cylinder for the ultimate level of performance. So any way you decide to go here, you're gonna have information in the cab from these load sensors that you guys can be assured uh, that you're making uh, a better decision, that your drill is operating for better than what it was in the past. So for 2019, Cedar Force is compatible with John Deere uh, row units, so 60, 90, and the new Pro Series row unit. So this includes all box drills, CCS, and, and air cart drills. So we can take uh, any of those to the next level of performance. So I wanna leave you guys with this quote from H. James Harrington. So he's an engineer. So his quote is, measurement is the first step that leads to control and eventually to improvement. If you can't measure something, you can't understand it. If you can't understand it, you can't control it. If you can't control it, you can't improve it. So all of us want to improve our operations, right? Otherwise, you guys would not spent the time and the money to be here today. But ask yourself, if you guys have the right measurement tools on your planter or your air seeder to give you real-time information in the cab that you can make a better decision and improve your planting performance. So if you don't have those right tools, We'd love to partner with you and, and with a precision planning dealer uh, to help you out in that area.